Welcome to Mental Health Bites. This is a Zoom podcast for today's BSU and NTC student. I'm Amanda Gartner from the Student Center for Health and Counseling. Today, I'm very excited to introduce from the BSU Music Department, Professor Miriam Weber and Dr. Lowry, who will share their thoughts on the topic of music and mental health. So welcome, both of you. Um, I would just like to start off if each of you want to take a moment and just let listeners know your background and your role here at BSU. Great. So I, I can start if that's okay. So I'm uh, Dr. Hillary Lowry and I teach single reeds here at BSU. So I teach clarinet and saxophone. This is actually my first year at BSU and I'm uh, happy to report that myself and my my little dog have survived our first real winter. So very excited about that and very excited to be here today. So thanks for having me. Thank you. And I'm uh, Professor Miriam Weber. I teach uh, music the music theory classes at BSU. I also teach um, bassoon and music technology. All right. So we have two instrumentalists. And fun fact, I have also worked with Professor Weber's husband, Ryan, in the past, who's also big into music. Yes. <laughs> um, let's just start off because I bet there's going to be a lot of uh, information today, but what does music and mental health mean to you? And either one of you can start with that question. I think we talked about, I'll start with this one. Um, so to me, music can be a medium for entertainment. It can relax the mind. It can energize our bodies um, and, and kind of help us express ourselves. There are so many different genres of music that can do all of those different things. Um, and, and I think it can really help us when we can't find the right words. Um, I, I think that for me, um, music can really be used as a medium to process emotions, to process trauma or grief. And um, that's one of my favorite connections between music and mental health, but it can also be used to calm us during moments of anxiety. I know for me personally, you know, I, I've struggled with performance anxiety um, for a very long time, but also if I have a, an interview or a stressful situation that's coming up, I have certain songs that I listen to that can really bring me back down to earth. So that I think that's what music and mental health means to me. And I just want to make a comment, Dr. Laurie. I often think of music as almost an international language. It's it, To me, it seems like it doesn't matter what nation you're from. Once you hear it, those emotional feelings rise and not that I've studied it but that's what I was reminded of when you mentioned like it's it's another way of expressing ourselves and I do feel like that crosses boundaries so thank you I completely agree <laughs> and Professor Weber uh, what are your thoughts yes yeah okay so I'm um, going off from what you said um music actually exists in every culture they found that um no matter how um how um, what level of culture you're talking about, if you're talking about uh, more developed cultures in which people can listen to music for entertainment, but even cultures in which um, people spend every waking moment of their lives working to, just to exist, to working um, to create food um, so that they can continue to survive, even those cultures um, prioritize music. So music is an important part of who we are as humans, and I think um, our connection to emotions and mental health is a big part of that. Uh, for me, I, I didn't grow up talking about mental health and emotions very deeply. We didn't talk about feelings in my, my family, but I found that music still allows me to connect to that, my um, emotions in ways that maybe not being, um, when I'm not performing or practicing um, can. Some people say this about exercising. They say you can't outrun your feelings when you're exercising. And I feel like it's the same for me when I'm practicing. I can't outpractice my feelings. If I'm feeling uh, particularly uh, upset about something, what if I start to practice those feelings actually bubble up, even in like just practicing scale. So nothing that even has to do with, we would think would have an emotional response that immediately starts to come up. And I think 
part of that is that when we're practicing alone, we are in a, in a world with our own thoughts, but I think the music also brings it out. I really enjoy practicing and working on music alone because I think it does allow me, like um, Dr. Lowry said, to sort of help process through some feelings. If I'm working, um, if I'm working on something and I'm, I've got some like um, upset about something or I'm anxious about something, I usually have to actually put the instrument away because practicing um, brings up those feelings in such a way that I can then deal with them um, and I, I, like acknowledge that they exist and this is a problem and this is where it's coming from so that I can, can get back to the practicing. So I actually like um, I like that about music because I think it keeps me connected to my emotions in a way that um, if I weren't a musician, I think it would be harder for me to pinpoint why I'm feeling the way I'm feeling. If that makes sense. Um, for me, it does tend to be a more subconscious thing. I don't necessarily get swept away by the emotions of music. It tends to be more of a subconscious thing. I, I feel connected to my emotions as I'm practicing in general rather than in a specific moment. But I think that's that's one of the beauties of music is that we can um, we can still be connected even if we're not having an emotional sort of reaction in the sort of in the immediacy of it all. Um, but music also sort of, uh, I think Dr. Lowry spoke to this too. She said it calms her down. It sort of centers me. If I'm just in a million different places and, you know, I think this semester for a lot of students is a very busy one. I'm hearing that from students that they're just sort of feeling overwhelmed. I think things are starting to open back up again, which is great. But what that does is it pulls on our time in a lot of different ways. I'm hearing from my students that they just feel pulled in a million directions all at once. And so the thing I like about practicing and um, being in the part of music or even performing is that when you're sitting either on the stage or in the practice room, the only thing that you can, can't have, we can use to focus on is we have to focus all of our mental energy on our music. And so what that allows us to do is it allows some of the anxiety of the world to sort of wash away and we can sort of allow ourselves to just be in the moment. And I think that's a really helpful thing for, at least for me as a musician, to just let some of those like stressors and because again it's a busy uh, semester for students but it's also a busy semester for faculty i'm hearing that from faculty too so we can just sort of let all of like negative energy just sort of leave for a moment and recenter ourselves and sort of find ourselves again so i guess that's for me it's more of an internal thing rather than an external but i think it's it's useful um on both sides of that yeah and hannah logged in so she might have some thoughts but definitely what i'm catching from you professor weber is that idea of what we would call grounding just being in the present mm -hmm. moment yeah. and that exactly. calming practice so that's a wonderful bonus for anyone who's touching music but hannah any thoughts no oh, it sounds like there's like a balanced perspective i i didn't hear all of hiller's response between like consuming music and um, how it impacts us, but also how it comes out when you're producing the music and um, playing the music. And it sounds like a really balanced perspectives. Yeah, and fun fact for mm -hmm. our music department, but many students in my office have mentioned like choir is one of those things that keeps them going or being in band and being able to just be present, not just because those are available on campus right now, but in general, it does seem like those are two of the courses that are very helpful in general for mental health and feeling supported. Mm -hmm. um, any other thoughts? Did, I'm sorry, there's too many people on my screen. Can you? Oh, I was going to oh, yeah. add something. If, yeah, no, I was going to say, I think that's really important. I think um, we've had um, a conversation recently about mental health for students and music. And I think it's an important thing to be a part of the production of the music in some way. Um, music is a, a especially social event. And so in COVID, it's been difficult for musicians and for students that can't make music. But as things are starting to open up and we're finding ways to make music, I recommend for students to become involved in some way because music is a, a social aspect and it it speaks to that ne our need as humans to interact with other people and to like touch not physically touch but be in a room in a space with other people um, and so if we can do that as we're interacting through music which we we know is sort of an emotional release it allows a lot more um, I think a lot more options for students for that. So there's a lot of um, there's a lot of ensembles on campus. We also have some community ensembles that are going to start opening up pretty soon. And I would recommend to students if they can 
If you can't do that, sing in the shower, sing along to the radio, make up your own words if you don't like the words, make up your own choreography. Um, just join in the production of the music uh, in some way. And, and we, if we can make it more active, I think it, it um, allows some of a more uh, a, a for us to be sort of um, involved in our emotional health that way. Yes, and you are answering one of my questions. How about the non-musically inclined students? So mm -hmm. also worthwhile to just blast the tunes and sing along whether you're in the car or shower. And Dr. Lowry, I, I think we're touching on something I had been emailing you previously about music as a coping skill. And you had also mentioned trying to be physically involved with the music. Do you have more thoughts on that as well? Yes. So, you know, as, as a classically trained musician, you know, it's really easy for me, like Professor Weber said, when I am feeling anxious or frustrated or whatever, you know, feeling it may be that day, practicing does help me to center myself. I'm actually a person who plays very well when I'm angry. Um, I don't know what it is. I think it's just a release that I can do. And that that is a physical connection for me um, with my instrument. It's just kind of, I become one with it and can let those emotions out through the clarinet, which is really nice sometimes. Um, but, you know, as, as we were talking about those who don't play an instrument, you know, when I'm driving or, you know, having you know, a rough day, or even if I'm having a great day, um, it's often made better if I hear drum to whatever I'm listening to on the radio or something like that. I, um, I think this touches on another question we might get to, but, um, you know, for instance, if I'm really missing home, you know, this is a, a tough time to be new in a place, to move across the country, by yourself, um, which is the situation I'm in. You know, this is my first year in Minnesota. I never set foot here um, until July 1st. Um, and I, I moved here in the middle of a pandemic. And so while, yes, I've been able to meet a bunch of colleagues around here and they are fantastic, um, it's still really easy to sink into that I'm completely alone feeling, right? Um, and so something that I do um, that is kind of a physical and mental connection. I go on walks a lot um, when I can with my dog. And um, I'm from Norman, Oklahoma originally, and I grew up listening to country music. That's what my family listened to in the car. And um, every time I listen to it, it's just this real sense of nostalgia for me. And so if I'm having a day where I feel really lonely or sad that I'm by myself, I get out of the house, I get fresh air, I get my blood flowing, and I listen to country music because I automatically feel like I'm home. And um, I talked to some of my students about this in um, world music. I teach world music as well. And we talk a lot about what music do you like? Why do you like it? Do you like it because your friends showed you that music or you grew up listening to it or you discovered it on your own or you were at a music festival and heard a new band. Whatever it is that brings great feelings to you, do it. If it's while you're out for a walk, getting some fresh air, getting some circulation, even better because that's going to boost those endorphins even more, so. Yeah, thank you. and. Um, Professor Weber, can you think of a specific time when music played an important role in your mental health? Yeah, I have I have a, a story for that, actually. Um, I lost my dad about seven years, six and a half, seven years ago, and um, he died unexpectedly. He wasn't in good health, but it was an unexpected, uh, unexpected passing, and so um, I found music music became an anchor for me a couple of different ways. Um, we've talked before about how music sort of grounds us and having a space to just play and for things to be normal was really helpful for me. But what I actually found the most healing was um, singing. Specifically, it took me, um, it, I found singing hymns at church, one of the most healing things you can talk about. I could talk about my grief and that sort of thing. And I, I wasn't really as connected to how I was feeling until I started singing about it. And then, um, and usually like 
I say the water work started, but for me, that's a good thing. I don't, I'm not a, a very um, emotive crier. So for me to cry, it's a, usually a good thing. It usually means I've, I've um, become in touch with, enough with my feelings that I'm, I'm able to release them. So for me, being able to cry was an important part of it. And um, it took me like, I don't know, for over a year, after, every time I went to church and we started singing, I would just cry. And it was so good for me to just be able to like, become that in touch with my feelings. For me, I found music, especially one of the most um, healing parts, healing parts of my grief to be able to um, express myself through music. I think it was one of the most um, um, meaningful ways for me in, in that respect. I just felt that I found it really interesting at the time that I could talk about it. I could know how I was feeling, but I really couldn't like uh, express it in a way that was deep enough for me to really um, deal with it until we, we started putting it to music. And I even like in an intellectual way, I found it interesting at the time, like this is interesting. We can talk about it. I can talk about my dad and I don't get weepy or any sad or like I can talk about him. It's fine. I can talk about how the grief is. Uh, I'm processing the grief, but once I start singing, then it processes right at the surface. And it's that, that level of um, emotional connection is so much higher in music. I, I found that really um, useful for me. Uh, especially that's when I was playing classical music to be honest when when we put it to the text to the music to the actual text I found that more useful yeah thank you for sharing that's um, a really key example it fits with a training I did about it was more using creative arts for grief and loss but they had a little bit of data that I don't recall where the research was from but basically sometimes in terms of processing grief and loss to use our senses first because words only do so much our prefrontal cortex only do so much mm -hmm. so to me it translates perfectly that performing arts the same as visual arts you know hearing is tapping into something deeper and more primal than just trying to find words to an experience that is sometimes beyond words so thank you for sharing mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. hannah did you have any questions I really wanted to reflect on that. I really like that both of you talked about how you lean into your emotion and like allowed yourselves to experience it. Because I think it's something that when we talk with students about coping skills, the first ones that they talk about are use of distraction. And we talk about like, that's a useful coping skill if maybe like you're trying to go to work and you're trying not to think about uh, grief or loss but that there are times to allow yourself to feel those emotions and that that's healthy and that the way that you're processing it and talking about it is um, really fantastic. And I really appreciate it. Um, Amanda, did you wanna move into tried and true? Yeah, for the sake of time, we're gonna keep flowing um, because this is a bite. And with you, if anyone has more questions, you can always email the music department, maybe get involved in an ensemble or one of the choirs, but we want to take time to get to know both of you on a personal level. So we'll start with Dr. Lowry, then let Professor Weber answer each question. So the first question is what brings you comfort? How about you, Hillary? Um, so I, I think it actually touches back to um, something that Professor Weber mentioned, and that's the social aspect of music, that sense of community. Um, we've been missing it this year, of course, but um, I, the times I get to play with my students or play with my colleagues, um, wow, that's so comforting to be around other humans doing the same thing. So I, I can't think of anything more comforting for me than that. <laughs> Yeah, I agree with Dr. Lowry. The first time I went to a rehearsal after COVID, I think was like November. So it's been like eight months since I played in another room with a human being. I've been practicing on some solos, but like I hadn't played in a room with another human. And I was so overcome with just excitement and like shock that I was in a room and we were in the middle of like a rehearsal. I was going to play six notes and then leave. It was not a particularly exciting musical experience. I took a selfie and I was like, oh my gosh, I'm in a room and other people and we're playing music and I got a selfie out and I got trying to get as many people in the room as possible because I just couldn't believe how excited I was for what would have been just a sort of humdrum um, re rehearsal in, in another respect, but being able to play with other people is just, I think, so comforting for us. What keeps you going? 
I, I hate to repeat it, but honestly, that that sense of community keeps me going. But also um, the fact that we get to share our art with other people and the chance and the hope that maybe it can help somebody else get out of a tough mental space by hearing that and creating their own story really keeps me going and wanting to continue to do what I do. Um, you know, I, I talk to my students constantly about characters and their music. It's so much more um, about what story you're telling the audience and, and the story that they receive may not be the one that you were portraying, but it's so much more than notes on a page than, you know, dynamic markings on a page. It's what we're giving to the audience and what they take away with them after they leave a concert. So I, I think that's what keeps me going. How about you, Dr. Weber? I was gonna say what she said. <laughs> <laughs> we have a really fun last question. What is one thing you wish you would have known when you were a college student? I think that it would have been great to know that the person I walk into college, who I was then, is nowhere near the person I'm going to be when I walk out. And that that is completely okay. And it's awesome if that's the case. I'm so proud of that growth that I made through, through college. And I think it is so awesome. Um, so I would tell people to embrace that, embrace that change, uh, you know, explore different friendships, explore different relationships and discover who you are. It's a really exciting ride. I really like that. I'm just going to um, piggyback off of that. I was going to say learning, but I'm going to use your word growth, Dr. Larry, because I think that's a better word. I think um, I wish I'd, I wish I'd known that growth is hard, but it's a good kind of hard. And that the more we grow, um, it will always feel difficult. I think um, I'm not I'm not a scientist, but um, my, from my understanding of how learning and growth works, is that you're creating new um, synapses in your brain, and that actually takes effort. And so I like to use an analogy of like you're boring a hole through a mountain. Like it's difficult work to get from one side of the mountain to the other, but it's so useful. And I've learned so much in this past year, even that every time I learn, I'm, it's exhausting and it's hard. But then when I get to the other side, I think I'm so proud of how much I learned and how I was able to grow. I think I want to continue to grow for the rest of my life. And so that's what I, if I wish um, I would have known as a college student that growth is hard, but it's so good. I think it makes us better people and learning makes us better. Thank you both for taking the time to meet with us today. This is a topic close to my heart and it was wonderful to hear from both of you. And as well, anyone listening, please tune in next week at 11 a.m. on Wednesday to learn about the social identity approach with returning guest speaker, Dr. Durth. Until next time, explore you and explore the world. Mm -hmm.